the powerful thing about this verse here in Romans 10, 3 is it says that when we're ignorant, which just means not knowing, when we're ignorant of God's righteousness, we then go about to establish our own righteousness. And the way I like to describe self-righteousness could be your own rightness. I got to be right. Now, there's something I've said over the last few weeks or a couple of weeks that I want to reiterate, and we're going to move forward in some new material. And that is, is understanding righteousness when it comes to my relationship with God. The Bible teaches us in his word that there is none righteous, no, not one. That's Romans chapter 3, verse 10. There is none righteous, no, not one. We, we could, we could, we could, we could uh, go to church every day of the week, and that would not make us righteous. There, there, there's nothing that we can do to, in and of ourselves to make ourselves righteous. And so there's a, there's, there has to be this understanding of righteousness because when you read in Scripture, the interpretation of that word is not always the same. And the way I like to explain it is that Jesus came, he died for our sins, he spilt his blood, he died on a cross so that we could have our debt to God of sin paid, that we could have right standing with God. In other words, the prayers that, that, that I would offer the Lord in this very moment, the praise and the prayers that I offered just a few minutes ago while Jaylee was leading us and the team in worship, those prayers that I offered to God, me personally speaking, were not, Lord, I'm in church today, I'm trying to live right and do right, so I thank you that you hear my prayer. Mm -mm. No, my prayers are based on Jesus died for me, spilt his blood for me, and by his sacrifice, I have boldness to come before the throne of God to obtain grace and mercy through Jesus Christ, that even in my sin, he is faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me of all unrighteousness when I come before him, according to 1 John 1, 9. So that right standing that I have with the Father is because Jesus paid the debt that had me separate from him. We talked about that in part one, but it's so important that you get that, that we get that. That the, 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 the rights that we have before the Lord, the, 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 the promises of yea and amen, 2 Corinthians 1 and 20, the access to God through worship, through praise, through thanksgiving, through prayer, that access, that right standing that I can go before the Father was provided for us through Jesus Christ. Not because we did all the right things, crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's. Anybody with me here? Jesus gives us that right standing with God. Now, just because you've been given right standing with God doesn't mean that you are right standing for God. Now, that's the difference, and that is, okay, Jesus has offered me right standing with God because he died for my sins, but now am I representing the Father? Am I representing his kingdom in the righteousness of my life? And so there's a difference between standing right with God and standing right for God, we need individuals to know that through Jesus Christ, you can stand right with God, and by the power of his spirit and word, you can stand in righteousness for God in representation. There's two key words in those two statements, and that is, number one, relationship. I can have relationship with God through Jesus Christ, and then the second one is representation. I represent Jesus I represent the Father, I represent the kingdom of God by doing and living what's righteous, not based on what the world says is right, because the world is shifting all over the place and constantly changing in what is acceptable and not acceptable. And any given culture, no matter what city, state, or nation you live in, any culture can be defined by two easy things. What is disciplined and what is celebrated? One more time. What is disciplined and what is celebrated? And you can tell the culture of a family, the culture of a home, the culture of a community, the culture of a, of a nation by what is disciplined and what is celebrated. Ultimately, that defines culture. 
But you and I have been called to represent not the culture of this world. We've been called to represent the culture of the kingdom of God. That in everything I do, I am to advance the culture of God's kingdom. That's why when Jesus stood up and ministered what is called the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 5, Matthew 6, and Matthew 7, those three chapters, Jesus' longest sermon the manifest of the king, he was laying out what the culture of his kingdom looked like. And you and I have been called to advance the culture of the kingdom, not the culture of the world, not the culture of, of some tradition or some religion or some movement. I'm called to advance the culture of the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. That's my objective. That's who I represent. That's what I represent. That's the mandate that's on our life. Romans 12, 2 says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. Therefore, I'm not going to receive my right standing with God via Jesus and then misrepresent who he is and the way I live my life. Can you say amen? Now, saying amen doesn't mean you got it all together. Saying amen just means so be it. That's the truth, preacher. Come on with it. Amen. Now, come over if you would from Romans, well, you're in Romans 10. I went back to Romans 3. But if you would, turn back to Romans 6. Romans 6. And, and let me give you a few verses that I mentioned last week that I, I need to reiterate for wh where we're going to go here. The Bible is God's instruction manual for righteousness. That's not some cute statement that I made up. That's 2 Timothy 3.16. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Inspiration means it's God breathed. God breathed. All Scripture. All Scripture. Getting ready soon to, to minister a two-volume series. Oh, I, I'm excited about what's getting ready to happen. You're going to minister a two-volume series soon. The volume one is going to be called The Authority of the Scripture, and then volume two is The Power of the Gospel. Believers need to understand the authority of the Scripture and the power of the Gospel. They work together. The one does not remove the other. They work together in harmony. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16, and he says, All Scripture, that's the Word of God, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, which just means teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, for instruction in righteousness. So where do I get my instructions for righteousness? I get it from the Word of God. That's where I get my instructions for righteousness. I love what Pastor Brian shared at the offering about the difference between tithes and offerings and that we, we have a written word on the tenth is holy and belongs to God. Leviticus 27, 32. Paul is speaking of that in 1 Corinthians 16 when he talks about laying aside based on how you've prospered. But there's no scripture, as Pastor Brian shared, there's no scripture that tells me how much an offering is. So I need the Holy Spirit to speak that. But when you have the written word of God on anything Thing. You don't need to feel it. You don't need to wait for confirmation. You don't need somebody to say, oh, you ought to do this. Oh, that's confirmation. I've been reading in the Bible where it says ought to do this, that, or the other. No, when you get God's word on it, you just got God's word on it. God's word is God's word, and his word will never return unto him void. And so when we read it in his word, that is his position. That is our instruction in what he calls righteous, what he calls or deems as right. With God, it's not a relative term, and it's not based on what's going on in society. Now, when you go with me, if you go with me to Romans 6, because I shared with you last week that from Romans 4 and into Romans 5, we, we understand this righteousness that Jesus has given us. And let me just pull out one verse because it's just literally jumping off the page at me right now. I gotta read it. And that's in Romans 5, verse number um, 17. So let's just back up over there real quick and look at it. For if by one man's offense, 
For if by one man's offense, I'm Romans 5, verse 17 is where I'm at. For if by one man's offense, one man's sin, Adam's sin, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace, read this next statement out loud, and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one who? Jesus Christ. Simply put, Adam made me a sinner. Jesus made me righteous. Come on, somebody. That's a word right there. So here he's saying that righteousness, that right standing with God, is a gift. Now, that's where you need to understand that word when you read it. Okay, what is he talking about? The gift of righteousness. Jesus gave me a gift called right standing with the Father. That means I can pray to him. I can come before him. I can have a relationship with him. I can walk with him, talk with him, hear from him, honor him, praise him, be blessed by him. How do you have that relationship with the God of heaven and earth through Jesus Christ? Well, what gives you the right to pray to God? Well, it ain't me. It's Jesus. That's why I pray in Jesus' name and not in my name. Jesus said, whatever you ask of the Father in my name shall be given. Why? Because it's his name that gave me the right standing. It's his name that gave me the access. Is everybody understanding what I'm saying here? So that right standing that we can have with God has been provided by Jesus Christ. If I died today and there's a hypothetical and I'm standing at the gate and it is a debate whether I'm coming in, and it's all hypothetical, okay? And the apostle Peter himself said, James A. McMinnis, why should we let you in? I would just keep hollering the name of Jesus. That's all I got. That's odd and read in Matthew 7, 21 that many will say in that day, I preached in your name and did great works in your name and I done this in your name and I did that in your name. But I've already read in Matthew 7 that the Lord in that day will respond, I never knew you. You were doing these right things, but I didn't even know you. Why? Because you were out doing these right things, but you did not have right standing. Right standing only comes through Jesus Christ, and any right living should be a reflection of right standing. I don't have right standing because I've had right living all my life. Jesus gave me right standing, and by the power of his salvation, his spirit, and his word, if you see right in me, it didn't come out of me. It came out of him. I'm just representing him through the relationship that he gave me with the Father. Hallelujah. Now, what we've got to get into in this series is why aren't more believers living out and standing up for the righteousness of God? What has silenced us when it comes to God's word? What what has caused us not to want to yield to the righteousness of God's word and God's spirit? That's something that we've got to address here. Now, that's what he's going to end up dealing with over in this sixth chapter. So go with me. Uh, well, let me finish uh, verse 17, and let me just get all the way into chapter 6. We're bad about reading a chapter and then jump into that number and rec- not recognizing that it was written. It didn't have those numbers in it. So let's just keep reading into verse 18 of Romans 5. Therefore, as by, one, as by the offense of one. Now, who was that one? Adam, okay. Therefore, as by the offense of one. Judgment came upon all men to condemnation. So that that judgment fell on all men. If you back up to verse number 14, he's saying death reigned from Adam all the way to Moses. And the reason why he says that, Adam to Moses, is because in between Adam and Moses, in between Adam and Moses, there was no Ten Commandments and there was no law given. In between Adam and Moses, no Ten Commandments, no law. But yet folk were dying. How how could I die for, for breaking the law when there was no law between Adam and Moses? Because Adam's judgment, his sin, passed upon all men. Now, what Moses was used to do was to write out the law, the standard of God's righteousness and holiness to show man if you had to live by this standard, here's what it is, and no man could do it. There wasn't a man that could do it outside of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And so 
when you look at dispensations in Scripture, man, I feel like we're just talking about a lot of stuff. Are y'all hanging with me? When you talk about dispensations in Scripture, dispensations being time frames, there's a dispensation between Adam and Moses. Then there's a dif- dispensation between Moses and Jesus. And then there's the dispensation that we're in right now that Jesus has brought. Glory to God. And that is his grace. Now, when, when you look here in, in verse 14 where he's saying that there were people dying in between Adam and Moses, notice what he says in the rest of that verse. He said, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's trans- transgression, who was the figure of him that was to come. So he's saying that that penalty fell on all men. And just like that penalty fell on all men, the payment for that penalty became available to all men. Hey, 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 glory to God. That's good stuff right there. The the penalty of Adam fell on all men, for all have sinned. When Jesus, Jesus, Adam was a picture of Jesus, believe it or not. He, 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 that's why he's called the first Adam, and, and Jesus is not called the second Adam because we don't need no more. He's called the last Adam. Hey, glory to God. And the last Adam is a picture or a contrast of the first Adam. The, by the first Adam, all became sin, sinners. But by the last Adam, all could be made righteous, have right standing with God. That's the point here in Romans 5. Now, let's get back to verse number 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of how many? One. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Read verse 19 out loud with me. I want you to write it on your heart. Read with me. Ready? Read. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Hallelujah. I've been made righteous by Jesus. I'm not trying to get right. I'm not trying to get righteous. I have been made righteous. What does that mean? I've been made to have right standing. I've been made to have right standing. Well, what gives you that right standing with God? I I, I know what you used to do. No matter what you used to do. Jesus died for what I used to do. And I accepted what he did for what I used to do. And now I've been born again and I've been made to have right standing with God. Glory to God. That's so powerful. Does that mean when you look in my life, every every moment you're seeing me necessarily standing right for God? No, unfortunately, no. That's what we got to work on. But we have to understand that that right standing with God only came through Jesus. I I, I ain't, forget my bad English, but I ain't about to go to God and say, Lord, I know you're going to hear me after I've been serving you. I know you're going to hear me after I've been trying to live right. I know you're going to hear me after I paid my tithes last week. Oh, I know you're going to hear me after I've been loving my neighbor. Oh, I know you, no, no, I'm not about to go before God thinking he's going to hear me because of my own righteousness. No, I have a relationship through him. Hallelujah. Now, watch this. Verse 20. Moreover, the law entered. Now, that's the dispensation of Moses. Moreover, the law entered. That the offense might abound. So, whereas Adam was given one commandment and broke it, God gave out many commandments which caused the offense to abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, hallelujah, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life. By who? Jesus Christ our Lord. So let me read it to you another way. Even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life, courtesy of Jesus Christ our Lord. When it says by Jesus Christ our Lord, it might as well say courtesy of Jesus Christ our Lord. In other words, what's going to keep me in right standing all the way into eternity? Jesus Christ my Lord. He gave me that all the way to heaven. Glory to God. 
That, that's beautiful. If we understood the magnitude of that, we'd be dancing around church right now. That's powerful. Now, I know there'd be some that, 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 that would sit back and say, oh, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, Pastor. Uh, man, uh, what about sin? What about sin? Well, all right, we're going to talk about sin. That's why we're going to the sixth chapter. See, Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. We become the product of what we think. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 6 teaches, or, 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 or verse 23 teaches, that, that all the issues of life flow through the heart. In other words, the heart or the mind is, is the threshold to life. If you don't want a thing in your life, you can't let it in your heart because whatever develops in your heart will manifest in your life. As a man thinketh in his heart, he, he becomes that thing. He becomes what he thinks. If I get up here and tell you all, hey, you know, how pitiful we all are, how sorry we all are, how sinful we all are, and you know, none of us, you know, uh, deserve the goodness of God, and we walk out here and say, man, I'm a sinner. Man, I'm no good. Preacher sure told it right tonight. We all sorry. We all no good. And somebody invites you over to do something wrong. You say, well, might as well. You know, I ain't no good no way. But as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If you can understand what Jesus gave you, if you can understand what Jesus did for you and that he gave you right standing with God through that relationship now and his word and his spirit, you have the ability to live out a life you could have never lived had you not had that relationship with him. And that's what Jesus gives, which means if you see the fruit of righteousness in an individual's life, that fruit should be the reflection of a relationship that they have with God, a relationship that merits representation. Hallelujah. Now, watch this in Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Look at those next two words. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? That's why when we baptize, we say buried in the likeness of his death. Buried in the likeness, your old ways are dead. Your old life is dead. Buried in the likeness of his death. Hallelujah. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, read the rest, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So he's saying you can't walk in the new life until you have mirrored Jesus in death, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. You know, you and I have to recognize there is no new life until you have associated with Jesus' death. I got to die to myself before I can live for him. Hallelujah. That's the point that he's making right here. And for every believer that follows Jesus in baptism, that's the statement that you're making. You're not saying, oh, I'm ready to join a church. It is more than that. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to, 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 you know, to get a new T-shirt. It is a whole lot more than that. You, it ain't got to do with no new T-shirt. You know, we give a T-shirt, everybody gets baptized. No, you get baptized because you have come to know Jesus in a way that as your Savior and as your salvation, and you're ready to say, you know what? I want to die to my old self. I want to die to my old sin and all my old mess. I want I want to mirror Jesus, so I'm going to go down in that water to let everybody know the me you knew is dead. And when I come back up out of that water, I'm, I'm a new creation in Christ. This is a picture of a new life that I now have in Christ. And you can do that even if you got saved 15 years ago, but you have not been literally walking in newness of life, maybe you need to follow Jesus in baptism. You say, well, I got baptized when I was 12. Did you get baptized when you were 12 because you, you felt the conviction that you needed to die to your old self and live new for him? Or did you do it because your cousin did it? In other words, if it wasn't for the right motive, you need to follow Jesus in baptism at the very next baptism service to make that statement, I'm ready to die to myself so that I can live for him. That's the truth about baptism. Man, 
Come on. Now watch verse five. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death. See, I've got, I've got, to, be, I've got to be in Christ, in his death, before I can be in his resurrection. We shall be also in what? The likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. Read the next statement. That henceforth we should not serve sin. Hallelujah. So notice Jesus is giving me the power to not have to serve my sin and my lust, I've got power to overcome what I used to not have the power to overcome. Hallelujah. That's what he's saying here. Verse 9 says, Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Hallelujah. And that's the way we have to view our life with Christ. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves. Look at the Holy Spirit being country. Likewise, reckon. I reckon. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Now, verse 13 is long, but I want you to see it. Read it with me. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. What's he saying? He's saying if you've accepted what Jesus did for you, if you've been reconciled to the Father and you have followed him in, in, in baptism. Now, baptism is not necessary for salvation. That makes some folk mad, but they didn't take Lazarus, the, uh, uh, the thief off the cross to, 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 to baptize him and put him back on there. And when, when he confessed Jesus as Lord, Jesus looked back and said, today you'll be with me in paradise. I'll get an ugly letter. I can't help it. I'm not with you. Baptism is an ordinance that is to be given by the church. The church cannot give a man salvation. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our salvation. Should a believer be baptized? Absolutely. Absolutely, Jesus himself was baptized, and we need to follow him in baptism, but that's not what seals your salvation. It is the blood of Jesus that seals your salvation. Hallelujah. Now, notice this. He says, because you have been redeemed, because Jesus has given you this gift of right standing with God, now where you used to yield your members, body parts, flesh, you used to yield to sin. Now, by this newness of life that Jesus has given you, you yield your flesh to righteousness. So what's he saying? He's saying the right standing that you've been given with God should now be reflected in what you say with your mouth, what you do with your hands, what you do with your body, how you live your life. We should see the righteousness of God manifest in your life as a result of the relationship that you have with God. Does that make sense to everybody? In other words, I can't, I can't just say, well, I've been born again, I'm going back to the streets. No, you ain't going back no streets. Not without conviction. And maybe on another series, on another day, we'll talk about the danger of returning to what God delivered you from. Because God will allow that thing to destroy you. And, 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 and maybe we need to come back. I got a series actually coming up. It was going to come up this year, and I just didn't feel like this was maybe the year. But there's a series coming up that we have planned. It's all put together. It's called The Reality of Death. And man, 2020 has just been so rough. I was like, let's push that one to 2021. You know, I don't know if we need to talk about death anymore. So, but it's ready to go. And we're going to get into some things to really understand what happens, you know, at the grave and, and at death and, and beyond. I know it's going to be beneficial, Lord, Lord willing, when we get into that. But notice here that he's saying this, this yielding, this yielding is going to represent who it is I'm serving. Now watch verse 14. 
For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law? I don't know I don't, where in the world folk get this stuff. Because folk will quote that so fast. Well, I'm, I'm not under the law. That's in the law. That's in the law. All the time, folk quoting what's in the law, what's in the law, what's in the law. Where in the world did you read that just because it was in the law, you ain't supposed to follow it? But when did God make the law illegal? He, he never changed the authority of Scripture. It still reflects his will. We can't be saved by it, but it doesn't mean it's outside his will. Every law, even those things you read and you wonder why that's written, there's a reason why it's there. It's in your best interest always to, to do what the Lord tells you to do. His commandments are not grievous. They're, they're beneficial when we follow him, follow them. Now, watch this, verse 16. Know ye not that to whom you yield your servants... I'm sorry, know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So who am I going to yield to when sin speaks do I listen? Or when righteousness speaks, do I listen? I show the world who I serve by what I yield to. Some of you used to cuss some folk out. But you've been saved. And the Holy Spirit's given you a conviction to live for Jesus. And somebody ticked you off on the job. And oh, you would have cursed them right on out. But you're not going to do that now because you don't want to misrepresent Jesus. And your testimony is greater than your vengeance. But pastor, I'm right. I'm right. They did me wrong. I know you're right. But your righteousness is greater than your rightness. It's more important that you represent the Father than you, than you present yourself or represent yourself. Righteousness. I'm, I'm representing him. Now, let's drop down for, for, um, um, for time's sake down to verse number uh, 18. Being then made free from sin, that's what Jesus did. You became the servants of what? Righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members, that word members just means your flesh, your body. As you have yielded your, your members, your body, servants to uncleanness and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. Now notice what he just said right here. He said when you yielded your body to iniquity, it went from iniquity to iniquity. What does that mean? That means if iniquity were a swimming pool, you jumped in the shallow end, but before long you were in the deep end. Hello. That's what iniquity does. I start off, I'm ankle deep. Oh, I'm just going to dab in this. I'm just going to dab in this. I'm not going to go all the way in. You're going in. Iniquity always leads to greater iniquity. And, 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 and when, you, when you talk about the, 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 the um, cycle of faith, God has called us. We read in Romans, I believe, 117, that, that um, we live from faith to faith. Uh, another scripture says we live from glory to glory, faith to faith. Glory to glory. You, you might remember that old uh, 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 Fred Hammond song on his first album with Radical for Christ called The Inner Court where he said, uh, glory to glory to glory to glory. It just kept on going. Hey, glory to glory to glory to glory to glory to God. One amen. All right, I did all that. <laughs> messed up Fred and y'all gave me one amen. Okay, all right. Worthy. That's it. That, I, that wasn't worthy of it. Too many minutes. I messed up Fred. Fred, Fred, saw this right now. He'd come down here. We want you to come on down, Fred. We'd love to see you. But here, here's the thing. When you get into faith and you get into living for the glory of God, the Bible is teaching faith always leads to faith. Same principle. You got into faith in the shallow end, but before you knew it, you were all in. 
You know good and well there are some of you that didn't plan on giving this much of your life to Jesus. You were going to give a little bit. To, you're, maybe, maybe your motive was, I just want to feel better about me. I'm going to do just a little bit of this. But you, the Lord took you so much further than you ever thought you would go. That's faith to faith. That's glory to glory. The faith of God and the glory of God will always take you deeper and further into the things of God. That's what he's saying here. Just like dabbing in sin will only take you deeper into sin. Whoo, man, I feel like we are just, if this word were a lemon, we are drinking lemonade, y'all. I mean, we're squeezing every drop out of this word right here. Hallelujah. So he says here in, in, in verse, uh, what verse, man? Verse 21, or 20. For when you were the servants of sin, when you were living in a world lost, didn't know Jesus, watch this, read the rest. You were free from righteousness. Because you know what we used to do, we did, and we didn't think nothing about it. It's because you wasn't born again. Verse 21. What fruit... Had you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? He's saying, what you got left in that life? What did that life give you? What's your fruit? What, what, what is the fruit of that living, living in sin? Ver, the rest of the verse says, for the end of those things is what? Death. So I, I can't glory in all that. Verse 22. But now being made free from sin. Hey. Glory to God. Jesus gave me that. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin, wages is what you make. That's your earning. The wages, you work hard. In sin, and your payment is death. The wages of sin is death. But the gift, free gift of God, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I don't know how a, a clearer picture can be painted than what Romans 6 just painted right there. The, the, the result of my right standing with God that Jesus gave me should be right standing for God. And, and church, that. that, that we, we've got to deal more with that because that's what right now so many are missing is that standing right for God. Let's look at a couple of things here. If you would, go with me to, to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. <clears throat> now, there's no sin <clears throat> on that cross that Jesus didn't die for. So no matter what you see in your past, you can have the gift of righteousness through what Jesus gave you. That's good news. Hallelujah. And not everybody's going to have the same testimony. In other words, parents, if we're doing our job, you know, and, and, and we're, 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 we're pouring the word in, into our, you know, our, our children that seeds getting planted when they come to the age where they can start making their own decisions. They might dip and dab and break our heart, but we know the seed that we've put in there and we know the harvest is gonna come up in Jesus' name. We give them that prodigal advantage. And then there's some that that seed is planted and they don't dip and dab. They make a decision that they're gonna walk straight and narrow for the glory of God. And, and there may be some of you right now when you look back across your past, you don't even see a whole lot of mess. I ain't saying you didn't sin, you just didn't, you wasn't all in it. Because when ministering to people, it's important to know that many bear the mindset of what I call good old boy. In other words, if you stop somebody on the street and you say, hey, uh, if you die today, would heaven be your home? Oh, yeah, 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 I think so. Well, okay, well, uh, if you stood before the, the Lord today and he asked why you should go into heaven, what would you say? And that person says, well, because I've had this done thousands of times. And, and they'll say, well, um, you know, I ain't never killed nobody. I try to do right. I work hard every day, take care of my, 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 my wife and my kids. And, 
you know, I might drink a little, but I, don't, I keep it at my house. And, and I, don't, I don't hurt nobody with it. So, yeah, I think I could get on in. Well, I got moves for you, good old boy. You didn't get in with good old boy stuff. Good old boy don't get you in. Be, because the wages of sin, not just one sin, has passed on all men, for all have sinned. And so you can get deep with people, and you can say, well, look, have you ever told a lie? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, hadn't everybody? Well, no, I didn't say everybody hadn't. I said, I'm asking you, have you ever told a lie? Yeah, 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 I've told a lie. Well, then wouldn't that make you a liar? Well, no, no, I'm not a liar. I just lied. <laughs> well, no, if you lied, if you paint, for, if you paint, are you a painter? I mean, if you, if you sing, are you a singer? If you lie, are you a liar? Well, no. Well, well, well what about adultery? Are you, are you an adulterer? Oh, no, no, no. I've been faithful to my wife since the day we got married. Okay, have you ever looked at a woman with lust? Well, you know, hadn't we all? Well, no. We're trying to bring everybody in the same boat of condemnation. Have you looked upon a woman with lust? Well, well yeah, yeah, I have. Well, the Bible says you've committed adultery in your heart. So are you ready to take that before God? Are you ready to go before God and say, Lord, I never committed adultery, let me in? No, because you had lust in your heart. Eh, don't use that one. Uh, uh, Lord, you know, I try not to lie, but you did lie. Don't use that one. I was ministering to a man one day that swore to me he was going to heaven because he kept the Ten Commandments. And he kept telling me, well, I'll keep the Ten Commandments. I know I'm going to hell. I'll keep the Ten Commandments. When I went through the Ten Commandments, he wasn't even keeping them. And the end of his story was, I try. That, that's not going to get you there. The only people that see the kingdom of God are those that have been born again. And so, you know, the mess in my life, I got to be willing to own that mess. Lord, I, I, I have sinned against you. I have broken your commandment. I have broken your word. But I believe that Jesus died for my sins and I ask forgiveness of my sins and that you would cleanse me of all unrighteousness. And then there's a testimony of this new life that you're now walking with God that doesn't look like your life before Christ. But there are a lot of good old boys that don't think they need Jesus because they think they're not bad enough that they have to, you know, face eternal judgment. And then there's some folk that are straight up tell you. I've had them tell me, pastor, or, or, or the preacher, whatever they say, I, I bu I'm going to bust hell wide up. You cannot believe what you just told me. Surely you don't believe. And I've had folk tell me, look right in my face, I'm going to bust hell wide up. You cannot believe, really, that that's what's going to happen to you. Or you would accept what I'm telling you right now. And that is the gospel of Jesus Christ can save you right now from whatever your past looked like. He can make you brand new. Glory to God, that's good news. Now, that's a preview of what we're going to get into when we talk about the power of the gospel. Because the power of the gospel not only saves you, but it changes you, it renews you, so that the you that we see is not a reflection of the you you used to be. If your representation of righteousness convicts me that's not your fault that's my sin mm -hmm. this ain't gonna be popular I'm gonna say it again I'm not talking about somebody living some hypocritical point, finger pointing no we don't that's not Christianity Christ, Christians have gotten a bad name being called hypocrites we point our finger and try to put scriptures on folk and we're guilty of more mess than they are just our stuff ain't seen like theirs that, that's not Jesus we should represent Jesus in everything that we do. And when we do that, there's a standard of righteousness that we walk in. Would, would that standard make someone not walking in that righteousness be convicted? Yes, likely. And so what does the individual do when they're convicted by the righteous standard of another? The world wants to remove the standard. I don't want to feel bad about my mess, so there's something wrong with you. We've got to redefine what's right. We've got to redefine the standard to fit the world so that people that are living beneath the standard of righteousness won't feel so bad. But that is a good thing. When you're convicted of righteousness, that can save your soul. When you are convicted of sin, that can save your soul. Just like if nerves in my body are a powerful thing, I need these nerves to tell me that skillet is hot. 
Get your hand off of it before you burn your finger off. I need these nerves to communicate. Nerves are my friend. They tell me something is hurting, something is broken, something is wrong so that I can give attention to where I'm getting this pain. Conviction is the same thing. The conviction is the nerve to your soul. It is this nerve to your soul. And when you are convicted by the standard of righteousness, that is a reflection that you yourself are not in right standing with God. So if I were the enemy and I wanted to take as many souls as I could into damnation, then I would just convince them that there is no set standard of righteousness. Therefore, you live out any way you want to live, and I would make the culture accept that. That way, you would feel good about that and never know that that sin that you won't repent of, that you won't take to Jesus, is going to damn your soul. And when Christians compromise righteousness... We do the world an injustice. When churches change doctrine, when the Pope comes out and says, oh, I changed my mind. Man can marry a man. Where in the word did you read that? Where, where did you find that in scripture? It's not in there. That's, cha- that's catering religion to fit the world. That's catering the gospel to fit the world. It's catering the church to fit the world. And it won't help the world. It won't deliver the world. All right, let let me wrap this up. I'm almost done. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. When you get there, say amen. See, I don't have the authority to change the word of God. I don't have authority to change doctrine. I'm going to get up one day and tell you, well, we're not going to sing Christian music anymore that that magnifies the Lord because, you know, when when the world comes in, they need to hear something that makes them feel at home. So we're going to start singing some country rock, a little R&B and some rap. And it's going to all be secular stuff that you'd hear on the radio. We want everybody to feel comfortable when they come. You understand? We can't be singing about Jesus. They don't know Jesus. So we got to change the standard to make the world feel good. So we're going to put secular music all in the 40. When they walk in, they think they're in a bar. Y'all laughing. You know, churches are doing that. They're lowering the standard because we're so hungry for people and unrighteous mammon. So I want the offering buckets full. I want to make sure we get a good offering. I need as many people as I can get here so I feel good about myself and look at our growing church. Oh, we, whoa, look, we got thousands. You got thousands of individuals that don't know Christ, that don't know the Word of God. What, what, what good would that do? We can't lower the standard to fit the world because we want to reflect to the world who Jesus is. <laughs> now, everybody, ain't, I'm glad y'all are clapping, but the whole, right now, there's a lot of folks ain't clapping over there. What are you talking about? I knew I didn't like that preacher. And, and we'll get into this in the series it, it's for the sake of righteousness that we've been called, and, and, and righteousness is the scepter of the kingdom of God, as we talked about last week, but it is the fear of persecution of righteousness that has caused many in the body of Christ to become silent. We, we fear, we fear the, the, the lack of, of being accepted and being popular and, and, and being approved, and so we got to go with the world so we can be approved and everybody love us. All right, I got to wrap this up. First Corinthians chapter six, when you get there, say amen. Now, let's start in verse number, uh, number nine. First Corinthians six, verse number nine. Everybody there? Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. So to break that down, fornicators is those involved in uh, unlawful, unrighteous relations. I know we got children in here. Idolaters worshiping false gods, adulterers being unfaithful to your spouse, effeminate man acting like a woman, abusers of themselves with mankind, homosexuality. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, that means drunken parties, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now that right there, if we stop right there, there many of us say, oh, why did you have to end with that? I'm out. (laughs) 
I got kids over here laughing. <laughs> it, 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 I mean, it's funny, but it ain't funny. But we, you, if we stop right there, we're like, oh, man, I'm, I, I've been guilty of some of that right there. And the world we live in is filled with this right here. And that's New Testament. It's not Old Testament. It's New Testament. But let me show you the good news. The good news is verse 11. Watch this. Of such were some of you. Hello. Of such were some of you. He's saying, y'all used to be some of that. You know you used to be that, and you used to be that, and you used to be that. Of, of such were, 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 not anymore, used to be, no longer me. Yes, I did it, but it's not me anymore. I've been forgiven. I've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. I now have right standing with God. I'm not that anymore. I was that, but that's not what I am now. Of such were some of you. Here we go. But you are washed. But you are sanctified. But you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So church, when you look in the Word and you see things that you know you've been guilty of and you know that you've lived in, and you say, man, I gotta come out of that so that I can get before God and get before Jesus and get my salvation. You got that out of order. You can't have the power to break these types of yokes without the Holy Ghost, without the blood of Jesus. Jesus gives me the power to change my life. He gives me the power to be a new person in Christ. The me you see, you would not have seen were it not for Jesus and what he did for me and how he revealed himself to me. But I had to come to him owning that the things I was doing were wrong and, and Lord, this is unrighteous in your eyes. Save me, forgive me, cleanse me, deliver me. I'm not preaching a condemning message to anybody that fell under any one of those things that I just listed. I didn't say, I, 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 not a condemning word in there because we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The message I'm trying to tell you is, is that no matter what's in your past, if you can own it as that's, that was not right, that did not fit the standard of his word, Lord, forgive me. Jesus offers a free gift called right standing where you can come before God and have a relationship with your father. And now when you walk away from from his throne, when you walk away from, from his grace, you now represent salvation. You represent a change. You represent a new life that's been changed by the glory of God. And I know folk will look at you, ah, I knew you, I know you. Now you knew me. I'm not who I used to be. He changed me. But you can't have all this mess, all this mess, and then say, Lord, I know this is all mess, but I know you accept mess because you change your standard. You don't, you don't apply those standards anymore. And so I'm going to come to you, Jesus, and I'm going to read present you in my mess. That's not biblical. That's not in the Bible. That's what the world is saying, but it's not true. When, when, when you have come to Jesus, you walk away different than when you were when you came. I know this is not popular. I'm trying to show you the truth. How can I be dead to something and then go, go to God and think he's not going to endorse what I was dead to. Oh, man. Can I read just one more verse? Let me, let me, let me read just one more and, and I'll be done. All right. Go with me to Matthew 25. I wouldn't plan on doing this, but I feel like I need to close on a different note or seal this deal a little stronger. So go, go with me to Matthew 25. If a person needs to see a doctor, because they really need to see a doctor, and the Bible says a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. So the reason there is medicine, medicine's supposed to do us good. Now there's some medicines I see on TV and they every time, I'm like, I think I just wouldn't take the medicine. But man, it was a 45 second commercial and 43 seconds was telling me all these bad side effects. By the time I got through hearing all that, no, I think I'll just deal with what I got. 
Y'all know what I'm talking about? So, but medicine's supposed to do me good. So you need to see a doctor, and that's okay. That's not a lack of faith. One day, I, 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 I used to have chronic sinus infections. I mean, chronic. Four to every six, four, four to six weeks, man, I'm getting sinus. I just couldn't stop getting sinus infections. And I remember seeing Dr. Mack, my dear friend, and I said, Dr. Mack, I just, man, I don't know why I can't just develop the faith to break this. And he said, Brother Pastor, that's what he called me, Brother He said, Brother Pastor, it's all right. Let me just medicate you until your faith catch up. I never forgot them words. He said, let me just medicate you until your faith catch up. I said, go on, hit me that. Way. Go on, hit me one time with that right there, there. <laughs> medicate you until your faith catch He said, well, we got to get you back in the fight. He said, you can't, we, we waiting around. We got to get you back in the fight. You got to be ready for Sunday. We got to get you back in the fight, whatever we got to do. I said, okay, 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 Dr. Mack. I never forget them words. Let me just medicate you until your faith catch up. <laughs> Man, I, I, was at, I was at a prayer service in Dallas. I was preaching in Dallas. I was at a prayer service. A lady came forward for prayer. And she said, Pastor, I need you to pray for me. And I said, yes, ma'am. What do you want me to pray for? She said, I got cancer. She said, and I got arthritis. She said, um, if God could just heal the arthritis. That's what she said. If God could just, I said, well, what about the cancer? She said, this arthritis is hurting me so bad. I could deal with the cancer if he just healed up. I said, darling, you ain't got to have either all with God. The same God. Which, which, one, which, which one you think will be harder on the Lord? If, you, if he heal you of the arthritis or the cancer. She, she literally told me, she said, you just last Lord to heal, heal this arthritis. Lay hands on his elbow, Pastor. Every time the weather changes, that thing lacks up on me. Said, Lord, please don't let the weather change. You need to move to Jamaica. Anybody have pains when the weather's changed? You, you, everybody have that? You know what I'm talking about? Pastor Brown, why you put your head in? You know what you mean. My mama used to say that. I thought she was crazy. Oh, the weather's getting ready to change. I'm like, Mom, what are you doing? Yeah, my elbow's hurting. I'm like, what? How in the world the weather getting ready to change because of the elbow? Man, I step outside. And man, I had shorts and a T-shirt on. I walk outside, I need a coat. Like, man, how mama know that? Weather changed, man. Y'all let me get back to the word, please. If you know you need to see a doctor, until you get convinced of the sickness, until you get convinced that it's not right, I'm hurting, something's wrong, I need to go see a doctor, you won't go. As long as you think it's something that's going, time's going to heal, you know, oh, it'll be all right, it'll be all right, it'll be all right, it'll be all right. I'm married to a nurse. I, I want to ignore everything. She'll look at that and say, you need to see that. I'm like, oh, that'll be all right in a few days. And then a few days, I'm like, ugh. I told you to call Dr. Mack. Half my calls, Dr. Mack, because my wife got on me. You better call Dr. Mack about that. I was preaching with a double hernia all last year. Didn't know I had a double hernia. Two, I just knew I was hurting every time I preached. My wife said, you need to call Dr. Mack. You need to call Dr. When are you going to call Dr. Mack? I mean, I'd be laid out in the car. And we left, I'd be laying there. Oh, God, I'm hurting so bad. Oh, I'm just... I didn't know what was going on. I'm just hurting. I get in there, and I had... They got there and do the procedure. I had two... Hernias. And lo and behold, I had Pastor Tyler preach for me while I was out having that procedure. And somebody put on the, the thing there and pray for Pastor. He, he's got hemorrhoids. I said, no, they didn't do that. I, 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 had, I had to bring Pastor Tyler. I said, Pastor Tyler, did you tell him? Did you pronounce the word right? Folks think I got hemorrhoids, man. It's a hernia. Got to be more careful. <laughs> you heard enough, you do what you got to do, right? You're like, man, I got to go see a doctor. This, this thing's not right. The conviction of sin forces you to go see Jesus. It took me 10 minutes to get that out. Conviction of sin will make me go see Jesus. And so what does Satan try to do in this world? He, makes, he wants to make every possible sin acceptable. He wants to shut your nervous system off. Oh, that ain't nothing wrong with that. You keep doing that. Don't let no preacher or nobody tell you that's wrong. Just do it. Because he wants that nerve shut off. Because if that nerve bothers you long enough, you're running to Jesus. You're saying, Jesus, I'm living this life, and everybody thinks I'm happy. But when I go to bed at night, I'm suicidal. And I don't have any peace and I'm anxious all the time, 
and I'm not happy with my life and I'm having to chase a drink with a drink because the previous drink didn't do enough. Conviction will lead you to Jesus. Conviction's a good thing. And that's why the world is trying to silence righteousness. It will prevent people from turning to Jesus. All right, I'm going to wrap this up. Matthew 25. No more stories, all right? Here we go. Matthew 25. Everybody there? Now, this is Jesus talking about the end when we, when we stand before him, all right? And, and so let's look at this in, in verse number uh, uh, 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and, the, and, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations... And he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. Naked, you clothed me. Sick, you visited. In prison, you came. Now that's all good stuff. Then shall the righteous answer him. Read that out loud. Then shall the righteous answer him. So now I know why all those things were done. I'm seeing who they were. They were those in right standing with God. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered and fed thee thirsty and gave thee drink? When did we see you a stranger and take, and take you in or naked and clothe you or saw you sick or prison and came? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren. The least means a person you wouldn't have given a second thought about the least in humanity, in your own mind or the world standard, you have done it unto me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Let me wrap this up by going all the way down to verse number uh, 46. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. You might say, well, I don't believe all that. Help yourself. I wasn't taking that chance. Because the only way I'm going to find out is die. And when I die, it's too late. I want to pray with you right now. And the first question I want to ask you is, are you in right standing with God? Have you accepted what Jesus did for you at Calvary? And then the second question I want you to think about and ponder on is, are you standing right for God? Are you representing his righteousness? Father, we thank you today for your word and that your word never returns to you void. And Father, I pray right now, Lord, that there be one person here, one person watching this live feed that doubts in their heart their salvation. May this be the day that they receive this gift of forgiveness, of cleansing, of salvation that you gave us all freely through Jesus. And Father, if there be any of us here that have accepted Christ, but we're not walking by your word, we're not standing for what you call right. If we have compromised, if we've grown conformed to the world and we're endorsing what you condemn. Church, there are too many believers endorsing what God condemns. It's not my job to point my finger and judge anyone. But it is my job to stand on his word and proclaim his word and not compromise his word. Because this world is going to pass away, but his word endures forever. 
And if you've lived out any of the things that we've read or talked about, the good news is the gospel of Jesus Christ will save you, redeem you. That's why he died. If we could have done it ourselves, Jesus could have stayed in heaven. So, Father, I pray today, Lord, by your spirit that you would just move on our hearts to respond the way we need to respond to your word. In Jesus' name. Now, just for a moment with your head bowed, is there something that you need to go before the Lord and ask forgiveness of? Because you can do that right now. You don't need a man to do that. Jesus does that. when you walk out of here, are you going to walk out of here bold for Jesus? The Bible says the righteous are as bold as a lion. Are you going to live by the standard of his word? Are you going to endorse his word? Let God be true and every man a liar? Or will you live conformed to this world? It's a decision we make. Who or what will we yield our bodies, our lives to? Sin unto death? our righteousness unto life. Father, I ask that you would lead us in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. I invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, I've seen in your word that there are none righteous, not one. And I acknowledge that of myself, I could never earn nor deserve right standing with you. But I believe you sent your son Jesus to die for my sins, to die for my unrighteousness, that I could be forgiven, that I could be saved, that I could have a relationship with you. So I ask for forgiveness by your blood redeem me cleanse me and by your spirit renew me empower me convict me to stand right for you may the voice of your spirit speak clearly in my heart Lead me in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake, for your glory's sake. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.